that preparation, however in depth you want to go, that's up to you. That there's no one telling you what to do, but you take pride in what you do. And when you show up for the game, now it's about performance. You can get by with bluster. You can get by with nailing a call, but at some point, your poor per preparation will be exposed or your poor performance will continue to show up on the air. This is Little by Little with Andy Schechtman. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to another episode of Little by Little. I have a real special one here uh, for you today, uh, a special one that's different than, you know, the 4,000 interviews that I've done over the last several years talking about economics and precious metals. And, you know, I and along the way before I introduce you, although a person who really doesn't need much in the way of introductions <clears throat> in the interviews that I've done mostly on the other side of the camera, uh, over the years, many of the people that I've done interviews with have been very successful in their own right. From various walks of life, people like General Fr Flynn or Robert Kiyosaki or Cash Patel or entrepreneurs, very successful businessmen and women in their own right. And one of the things that I've always thought about then kind of inspired me to do this podcast myself on this side of the camera is what makes these people tick? What has made these very successful people successful? And, you know, in, in having a conversation with our mutual friend, Russ Gans, yep. uh, he said, hey, you know, I can't think of anyone better that, that you could have on your show than, yeah. than my buddy, Ian Eagle. And uh, although you don't need much in the way of introduction, I think I'll make it anyway. I, I, I've done my research, I and I've done my research. <laughs> And and I was amazed by by what I read. Uh, very very much looking forward to this. Uh, obviously, the voice of the New Jersey Nets, CBS uh, NFL football commentator. I'm a big fantasy football fan, and so I watch you all the time. Of course, the the now lead commentator for the NCAA Final Four. Congratulations! What a what an honor that is. And of course, even maybe more remarkable. I know you're a humble guy, but seven straight play by play Emmys and eight out of ten. I'd say a kid from Queens has done well, uh, to say the least. But I will tell you, being on the East Coast of Florida, <clears throat> I'm pretty much the only guy from Minnesota that's ever walked the East Coast. It seems uh, all the people over here uh, that I've become very friendly with are from New York, New Jersey, many from Queens. I just got to tell you, there's something in the water uh, in Queens. Um, they're all exceptional in every way, uh, and you're no no different. And so I'll get right into some questions. And again, I'm so grateful that you've you've decided to join me here for a few minutes. So with that being said, let's just jump right into it. <clears throat> you know, doing my research, I read some stuff about you where you say at the age of eight that you knew you wanted to be a sportscaster. And you've mentioned calling play-by-play -play and pick up basketball. You know, if you only knew how many times I've seen Russ and the first thing I say to him is, Gan's down the lane again. <laughs> he explained that for me, and it stuck with me, and I I, I, uh, I, I throw that one out at him all the time. But, um, look, the question that I want to ask you centers around your childhood, first and foremost. And it, it, it took, took me back a little bit as being rather unique, kind of reminded me of my own childhood growing up uh, with two parents working in, in, in Minneapolis. But, you know, your father uh, got a big break with Xerox, and, and he was Brother Dominic. And your mother, uh, well, your father was spending time on the road as much as 200 days yeah. a year. And your mother was uh, expanding her career, spending time in Los Angeles. And, and, and you wrote um, that you went as far as raising yourself, uh, arranging rides to Little League games and putting yourself to bed. You said, I don't want to paint a picture that, like it was difficult because it wasn't it's just what i knew i guess my question to you really is how do you think those experiences shaped your independence and ability to navigate you know in an adult world early on i i think that probably says a lot about who you are well first and foremost Andy, thank you for the introduction second i was told that we were going to be talking about precious metals and economics so we're going to have to change my entire train of thought here back to me 
and my career and my childhood. And third, yes, you nailed it. Uh, that was probably uh, a big part of who I became based on the fact that I just grew up very quickly. I was responsible for myself at a very young age. That can go one of two ways. You can either take full advantage of that and become a complete screw up, or you can mature and evolve and see the world through a different lens. Fortunately, I ended up taking the the second option. It doesn't mean that it didn't come with challenges. It doesn't mean that there weren't times where I didn't do the right thing. I just learned from mistakes. I had a pretty good view of the world and where I fit into it, how to treat people, how to handle situations, uh, how to handle social dynamics. And it probably went a long way in me building confidence in who I was as a person and how I could interact with the rest of the world. So I wouldn't change anything, literally anything about how my childhood affected my adulthood. I think when you don't know any better and you don't look at yourself as someone that is getting the short end of the stick, that can often play the, the kind of role that is necessary in looking at life the right way. And I, I really have viewed it through that prism of I'm not a victim uh, I control my own destiny. Go out, do what you need to do. Do it with a smile on your face. Do it with a good attitude. Put everything you've got into what you do. Don't cut corners. Uh, don't find the easy way out. And I can honestly say that's the way I've attacked this thing from a career, from a life standpoint, relationship standpoint. All of that resonated with me, mattered to me. And all these years later, Andy, we're not young anymore. You do build up some wisdom, and there is a command that you find in certain situations that you can handle, and you convince yourself that put me in any situation, I'm going to figure out a way to make it work. Yeah, uh, that's very evident, and I often say that to my son. You may be smarter than me, kid, but you know, nowhere near as wise. That comes with with time and life experience. Sure. It was a different time back then, but it, in reading it, I, I gained a tremendous amount of respect. Uh, from the way you you brought yourself up and the way you conduct yourself and and that that's very cool i i hope people gather something from that i sure did you know a lot of people talk about luck and um i i don't really believe in luck um i guess there is some luck in life but you know the old adage luck is when opportunity meets preparation and yeah. and reading about your story i was blown away um by your your moment of truth, I guess you could say, uh, that defining moment at age 25. You know, I understand that you were working prior to that uh, overnight uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, and yeah. at a radio station. And, you know, you were you were paying your dues, you were doing your thing, but something led you to a meeting with the president, I guess, uh, the owner, yeah. the president of the New Jersey Nets. And you convinced him at 25 years old to become the play-by-play -play voice of the New Jersey, and that's something you still are today. And I, I just have to ask you, um, how did that come about? How did you, how did you handle that? And and how did it really become a defining moment in your career? Eddie, I was doing local radio in New York. I was doing very well, talk shows, updates, pregame shows for the New York Jets, and was moving up the ladder. And it started there as an intern became a producer when I graduated college, got opportunities on the air, made the most of them. I was told before I even took the job as a producer, do not take this job if you want to be on the air. You're not going to get it mm -hmm. on the air. And I took the job anyway, feeling as if if I got into the right environment, I learned osmosis, I paid attention, I bonded with my coworkers, and I almost treated it like graduate school in many ways, which was, in my mind, the justification for how little they were paying me. They were not paying me a lot of money, but I used them as much as they were using me. So I got these chances on the air, made the most of them. I was building a little bit of a reputation within New York City. 
This is the early 90s. And I see in a local media column written by Phil Mushnick of the New York Post that the New Jersey Nets play-by-play job was opening up, radio job. Howard David was the voice of the Nets. He was moving on, took the play-by-play job with Milwaukee Bucks, eventually was the voice of the Miami Dolphins, an excellent football and basketball announcer, but he was leaving the gig. And the Nets did not rate very well in the New York area. They were an afterthought. They were playing at the Meadowlands in Sea Caucus, New Jersey, or East Rutherford, right next to Sea Caucus. And I decided that I was going to try to go all in for this job. I ended up reaching out to a couple of people who put me in contact with the right person. That person told me that they were right on the brink of hiring somebody for the position. And I said, well, let me just come over to the office. I'll drop off my tape. And she said, great, you can do that. I can't guarantee you anything, but you're more than welcome to do that. So I'm from Queens, as you mentioned. I drive to New Jersey. I was living on the Upper East Side. And I didn't know a damn thing about the state of New Jersey. I had flown into Newark once in my life, and I saw smokestacks, and there was an odor I was taught at a very young age that New Jersey was an armpit. So I go into New Jersey. The first thing I realized, to get left, you have to make a right. There's jug handles everywhere. This made no sense. Why do I have to go right to make a left? But you did. In order to get to the offices, I pull in. This is pre-GPS. I'm just trying to figure it out. I get there. I tell the secretary at the front that... I'm there to meet with Amy Shear to drop something off. She comes down the stairs. She meets me. I hand her the tape. She says, hey, look, I'll take a listen, but odds are we're moving in in a direction. I said, that's all I can ask. She calls me the next day. She said, really like the tape. I played it for my boss, Jim Lamparello. He liked the tape. I said, great. She said, do you have some more recent stuff? This was from my college days. So this was 1994. My senior year was 1990. I'd given her a tape of a Syracuse Seton Hall game at the Meadowlands. I thought it was good karma. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I have more recent stuff. I had no more recent stuff. (laughs) That was it. That's all I had. My kind of guy. Yeah. So she, she said, well, when can you get me that? I said, how's tomorrow? She said, great. So, I saw the story on a Monday. I dropped the tape off on a Tuesday. I spoke with her on a Wednesday. I needed to drop off recent stuff that I did not have on a Thursday. I did know somebody at the NBA who worked at NBA Entertainment, which was in Secaucus, New Jersey. I called him up. I said, hey, is there any way I could come into your offices? You could play a tape of a basketball game. We could stick a mic in. And I can call the play-by-play. He said, yeah, yeah, I think we can make that work. I drive back out to Jersey, same jug handle. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I get there. I call one half of a net Nick playoff game from 1994. So just a, a month or two earlier, they put some ambient sound to the back of it so that it sounds like I'm in an arena. And that's it. I take the tape. I drive it directly to the Nets offices. Amy comes and meets me again. I hand her the tape and we say goodbye. She calls me the next day. She said, our owner is interested and our team president is intrigued. Can you come in for an interview Monday? I said, yeah, I'll be there. I said, out of curiosity, How many people are up for this job right now? She said, it's down to you and another person. I wasn't even in the mix on Monday. It's now Friday, and I'm being told I need to come in the following Monday to interview for the position. I take a chance. I said, well, who's the other person? She said, oh, you wouldn't know him. He did minor league basketball on the West Coast in Yakima. I said, well, try me. She gives me the name. I went to college with the guy. He did one year of graduate school at Syracuse. And in a way, because of the way that our structure was at the college radio station, I had responsibility in clearing students to get on the air. I had to listen to their tape. I had to critique them. I had to give them feedback. He was one of those students. 
So I think to myself, all right, it's down to me and this guy who I do know, and I know his work. And I go in very confident that I can get this position. They were not talking to a well-seasoned veteran NBA play-by-play announcer. I go in that Monday, I meet with John Spolstra, who is the dad of Eric Spolstra in 1994. Nobody knew who Eric Spolstra was. He was about to play college basketball at Portland on the West Coast. And John and I hit it off. Uh, I just felt really good about the, the vibe that we had. And at the end of the meeting, it was about a 20-minute meeting, I made a decision and I said to him, I looked him in the eye and I said, hey, John, I know you have to make a decision on this. I said, I really believe I'm going to be successful in this business. I said, if you hire me, you will always be known as the one that gave me my first really big break. And he smiled, and he nodded, and he shook my hand, he stood up, and said, great to chat with you, Ian. And I walked out of there, and I went back to my apartment. I had been married for one year. My wife and I, the next day, went on a vacation to San Francisco to celebrate our one-year anniversary, and went to Napa and Sonoma, and I checked my answering machine (laughs) Back in my apartment, and there was a message from Amy Shear, who I dealt with originally, saying, hey, give me a call. Called her from a payphone on the side of a small little roadway in San Francisco, the Bay Area, and she told me that I, I got the job. And then a bird shit on my pants. <laughs> so, That's the luck, they say. They it say- all happened. <laughs> What an amazing story, you know, much like your upbringing, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And, no doubt. And, and that's a, I wanted to bring that up because it kind of struck me, you know, as one of those moments where if you don't swing, you never hit the ball, you never hit Completely. a ball. And that could go sideways, Andy. I know, sure. I'm sure you've been in situations where your confidence and your conviction has served you very well. And then other situations where something might be misunderstood and someone didn't take it the way that it was intended. And obviously, with experience and uh, having different interactions in life, you you tend to read the room yeah. whenever you're entering those types of scenarios. And I, I've tried to do my best to read the room in every situation that I'm in. Well, that's what I think is so special about where I grew up in Minneapolis and, and where you grew up in a yeah. very diverse uh, part of the world where you're mm-hmm. you're forced to communicate with people and you know let's make the world go round. I'm sure there were many of them along the way that that shaped you and, and made you and prepared you. This is why there is no such thing as luck. That is when that opportunity presented itself and your preparation, I think, came through. Obviously, it did. And and in in, in that vein, <clears throat> I've noticed that you credited uh, your father's work ethic. Uh, and hit and an attitude in shaping your career uh, prior to his big break with Xerox you watched him work in uh, grind away as you call it in night in nightclubs and the Catskills yep. without bitterness as you say uh, and you adopted as you call it the worry about you mindset so you know much in that same vein can you just talk a little bit about work ethic and preparation I watched an interview you gave a, a cabinet filled with all of the the statistics of the teams that you're about no. to, to follow. And, uh, you know, someone like myself, who's who's constantly doing interviews, I, I've learned that if you're not prepared, you're yeah. not, and preparation eases all of the concern. Can you just speak a little bit about about that and how it shaped uh, your, your journey, if you will, uh, along the way? Andy, both my parents, they cared deeply about their work and how they presented themselves. So when you're a stage performer, every night is a different audience. Every night, you have no idea what people are bringing with them to that show. There are those that are there to get hammered. There are those that are there to enjoy it. There are those that are there that are trying to forget their problems. There are those that are there that are carrying with them the burden that uh, they can't shake. So as a singer, 
You're there to entertain. As a comic, you're there to make them laugh. I watched that dynamic play out night in and night out. And they were a team. My mom opened for my dad. So I'm in the car with them driving to the Catskill Mountains to the gig, hearing the back and forth. And then with them in the dressing room, leading up to the moment of performance, and then going to the side of the stage or going into the audience, I would be allowed to roam free at five, six, seven years old. I had the run of the place. I could sit wherever I wanted. I could stand wherever I wanted. So to watch all of that lead up and then the payoff, which was applause, laughter, joy, zeal, they were so consistent in what they did. And it blew me away. And it certainly made an impression on me in how they could bring, even if they were not having a good day, if they were fighting on the way to the gig, if my mom's throat hurt, if my father uh, was having an issue with his stomach, it didn't matter. Nobody knew. It wasn't their business to know. They separated, they compartmentalized, and there's no doubt I carried that with me in the job that I chose to do. You just alluded to two words that I live by. The first is preparation. The second is performance. The preparation part. That's all on your time. Nobody needs to know what you do. It's not their concern. You go to your office. You stay there for 10 hours at a time. Great. Maybe some people, it's two hours. Everybody does it their way. I still write everything by hand. That's what I'm accustomed to. Other people type it into their computer. My son does a similar job to me. He doesn't write it by hand, types it. Great, whatever works. That preparation, however in-depth you want to go, that's up to you. That There's no one telling you what to do. But you take pride in what you do, and when you show up for the game, now it's about performance. You had great prep. You had shitty performance. Mm -hmm. Bad combination. You had shitty prep but you had a great performance, not a great combination. Can you get by? You can get by. You can get by with bluster. You can get by with nailing a call. But at some point, your poor per preparation will be exposed or your poor performance will continue to show up on the air. I think that's a valuable lesson that that regardless of what profession you're in, <clears throat> that people should listen to. And and I couldn't agree more in, in my life. Uh, preparation, without question, has been the key to my success. And, and the few times that I haven't been prepared, it was a, a very regrettable learning experience, to say the least. You know, you mentioned things that stick with you. For me, I was a baseball nut my whole life, still am. And I don't know if you remember uh, Jack Buck saying, and we'll see you tomorrow night when Kirby Puckett hit the home run in game six and, and coming back for game seven. Of course, everyone remembers, you know, uh, the the one, uh, uh, do you believe in miracles? Yes. And yeah. Al Michaels calling the the uh, the miracle on ice. Uh, in your opinion, what separates, I, I got to ask you one sports question. Yeah, what please. separates a, a, a good call from a great call? Is it the moment? Is it the emotion? Yeah. Is it the way the story is told? Because I'll remember those two to the day I die. Yeah, it's a perfect storm. It's the moment. Can you meet the moment? Then there's another classification where you enhance the moment. The two moments that you just described, memorable. No matter what the play-by-play -play call was, you were going to remember the moment. But if you have a great caption in that moment, and by the way, there's no second chance. You don't get a backspace. You don't get a second take. You don't get to do it over. You get one shot at this. So, yes, you mentioned it, the emotion of the moment. Can you ride that wave of emotion? The crowd noise. Does your voice blend well with the crowd noise? And then word choice, phraseology, voice timber, inflection, pausing at the right moment, all of those things come into play. The two calls that you just mentioned, what made them so special? They were simple. They they weren't they weren't intricate. 
they both got right to the heart of what you were feeling in the moment. Maybe you couldn't articulate it as a fan. You knew you were feeling something very visceral, but those words, that phrase, it puts you there and it puts you there every time you repeat the words. And I think that's the goal as a play-by-play announcer. Not every game is going to produce the memorable moment that you just mentioned, Kirby Puckett and the Miracle on Ice 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team. What Jack Buck and Al Michaels did, they took what all of us were feeling and got the proper word, plural, for us to feel like we were there. And yeah, that's it what it comes down to. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. And, and it's funny because I'll still say things like that sometimes in, in the round of golf, and we'll see you tomorrow night. You know, it's uh, sure. it's an amazing it's an amazing thing to think about. I hope you get many of those opportunities yourself in the coming years. Um, you deserve it. Just Thank a couple you. more questions that I have for you. Um, you know, uh, as as we said earlier, relationships make the world go round, and and the key to my success in the precious metals world. It has been relationships, without question. Uh, you've worked with a variety of analysts and, and co-commentators. Uh, what do you feel or how do you feel that building chemistry with a new partner or, or what makes building chemistry with a new partner? How do, you, how do you do that when you sit down at a chair with someone you don't know and you have to make this, this, this chemistry on the spot? What, is, what, what makes for a successful broadcasting partnership? Putting them at ease, first and foremost, they're not going to do their best work unless they are in a state of feeling comfortable. And how does that happen? That happens before you ever get to the arena. That happens in the car ride over. That happens in the production meeting the night before. That happens at the lunch two days earlier. You have to treat it the way it deserves to be treated. It's a relationship. It doesn't mean that they're going to be your best friend for life. But for that three-hour period on an NFL Sunday or two and a half hours on an NBA game or two hours on a college basketball game or four hours and 22 minutes on a tennis match, on and on and on, you're in it together. And I have stressed it. I don't do a lot of the, the coaching traditional of, hey, this is what we need from you. This is what you got to do. You've got to make sure you've got that hand. That's that's not how I view the job. And that's not my job. It's not there to coach them. It's there to be a good partner. It's there to, to, to make them feel like they've got someone they can trust in that situation. I've worked with, I believe I'm at 162 different partners over a variety of sports over many, many years. And I can honestly say, looking back on it, that I did everything in my power to put them in a position to succeed. I don't look at it as, I'm going to do my thing, you do your thing, and then we'll just see where we're at at the end. It's my job to be malleable. It's my job to be flexible. It's my job to adjust and make it work. There are times where I have to to diffuse something with humor, and there are times where I have to step in and maybe take over in a moment because I recognize that my partner is not in a position to do so. It's being a traffic cop also and realizing that the flow of traffic it's on you and you control it and it can be smooth or it could be really disjointed it's up to you as the play-by-play announcer how you want to handle situations how your partner feels are they free to be themselves if they have a great sense of humor i'm going to lean on that if they're great with strategy guess what i'm going to go there If they love X's and O's, terrific. If they love background, biographical, storylines, not a problem. But don't make someone something that they're not. And I realized that very early in my career. And I did learn about chemistry working at WFAN Radio. There was an all-time historic combination at WFAN Radio for sports talk, Mike and the Mad Dog. I worked with them for a full year behind the scenes in 1992, and I really walked away from that experience with what I felt was fundamental knowledge on what makes 
this tick and how to how to really get the most out of who you're sitting next to or across from. And that means sometimes busting balls. And that means sometimes taking a lesser role. That means sometimes asking a question that you even know the answer to because you know it's going to make them look good. But you've got to you've got to look at it through the idea that you're a team. It's not just me, I and Eagle. It's I and Eagle and fill in the, the blank. We're together in this. And I, I try to empower uh, my analysts to feel like we're in it together. Yeah, I had a feeling you'd answer something along those lines. And, and I wanted to, to ask you that specifically because that, that transcends yeah. anything. Uh, I don't care if it's a personal relationship, a business relationship. There's so much wisdom in that. And again, it's communication, it's relationships, yes. uh, and very impressive. Just two more questions for you. One kind of anecdotal uh, your son, Noah, um, is following in your footsteps. To me, this is a sentimental one, as my son just came to work with me at Miles Franklin. Um, oh, that's for a few years. years in, yeah, after a few years in Manhattan, uh, finding himself uh, as a <laughs> uh, at, at Price Waterhouse, but coming from Minnesota, you know, as a kid who grew up somewhat sheltered, going and spending a couple of years on your own in Manhattan. Uh, Certainly, certainly put some hair on your chest and makes yep. you grow up. And I will tell you that it's been an amazing experience for me as a father. Uh, very gratifying. And I want to ask you about your experience with Noah. But, of course, in terms of doing my uh, present or my preparation, I came across something that I, I, I actually think is one of the greatest ad libs I have ever seen. And I wanted to play it for everyone here to see. I think you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so let me just play this because I found this to be so glorious. I want everyone to see it. This is your son, Noah. Uh, Ian Eagle is your father. Ian's been calling Nets games for over 20 years. And as you just mentioned that you've been around this team for so long. I mean, did you ever think that you and your dad will both be having yes on your mic flex, both call the games? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, I just, I spent so much time watching him. I just always thought that would be the setup. And I really, I've enjoyed it. And to be here is pretty special as did when he brings into the front court and starts the second court with the Nets up by one. Oh, oh well, I could ask any questions yet, but I was wondering because normally why in here we just why are you have a headset on right now? What is happening? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Walker's going to shoot two here to try to re-extend this. Walker, are you know it? Are you iron? With us. And Walker has been just such a revelation for this team on that one-year minimum contract. So much special promise that he's brought. So much punch off the bench. Really, an enticing sighting for this team has earned himself. A reputation around the league. And you know you're not working tonight. Drills that first free throw. Yeah, has anybody told him that he's not working tonight? Like, dude, clean your apartment. Actually, <laughs> he should just come sit in my seat. Yeah, dude, See, we we don't need like a double box. We can just have you two sitting next to each other. Do something productive. Walker splits the pair, and then this will go back to the defensive end. All right, Saturday night, no eagle on hand. Excited for it. That was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I mean, spontaneity <laughs> and and ad libbing. It was very cool. I I've watched that about ten times just because <laughs> I see it. What a cool moment! Um, tell me a little bit about what it means for you to have your son follow your footsteps. And it seems like he's uh, he's a chip off the old block. Yeah, uh, Andy. It's uh, it's been more than I could have even imagined when he let my wife and I know that this is something that he wanted to pursue. A lot of things start popping up in your head because I know how hard this job is. I know how hard it is to be successful in this job. I know how taxing it can be with travel and being away from home and all of the challenges that come with that. And then also, let's face it, being someone's son who's already established in the industry, uh, the questions that are going to pop up and the comparisons, you better have a thick skin, you better have a real strong sense of self, and you better have some legitimate talent or it's not going to work out. So we dropped him off at Syracuse. We did the full uh, go to bed, bath and beyond before they went out of business. Mm-hmm. What a what a great place to to get those last second needs. We get the the dorm room ready. We have dinner together. We stay overnight. We wake up. We get breakfast. 
We now make sure he's good to go. We give the final hugs. There might have been some tears shed. And my wife and I get back in the car. We get to the stoplight that leads to the highway that literally is just off Syracuse's campus. And it's going to take you to 81. And as we're getting on the highway, my wife turns to me and says, is he going to be any good at this? And we've done the drop off. We've made the first payment for freshman year. We've had the conversations. And I turned to her and I said, I don't know. Because you don't know. (laughs) Just because you want to do it doesn't mean that you can do it. And the reality is uh, he turned out to be excellent at this and has uh, been very fortunate in the opportunities that he's gotten and the ones that he's taken advantage of on very big stages beyond proud our relationship which was already very close on a father-son level is now at a different level because we're having conversations about the business we're having conversations about the field and the industry that only two people that do this for a living could really understand and relate to one another. So it's been glorious. And, you know, one of the things in watching an interview with him that I thought was cool, he said, yeah, but he's still my dad. And I talked with him for 45 minutes. And at the end of the conversation, he said, oh, by the way, I got the the NCAA gig. And, you know, I, I, I again, that's something I appreciate yeah. as well. And um, and and it just it kind of um, thanks it kind of puts everything in, in proper context for me so last question for you and this has been amazing and I again I really appreciate your insight because while a lot of this is talking about your career and your upbringing uh focusing on on it as a broadcaster a damn good one um I think what you said and the way that you brought yourself up um and the lessons that you learn transcend everything and and People can learn a lot from this. Uh, I already have. Um, and in doing my pre- preparation, learned a lot uh, about you as a person and, and uh, admire it greatly. Appreciate Last question, uh, looking ahead, uh, what do you still hope to accomplish in your career and uh, what's next for Iron Eagle? And and how do you want to be remembered in this field as, a, as, as one of the best sports commentators uh, to ever don the microphone? Well, it's interesting. You hit on something earlier that... I certainly have believed, and that is, I haven't had my best call yet. I've called thousands of games, and I believe there's still an event or a moment that I will call in the future that will go down as the greatest moment in my career, which gives me the same fire and excitement and hope every time I start preparing for an event. Next week, the NBA starts, so I have the NBA, I have the NFL. I'm doing four to five games a week, oftentimes in four or five different cities. You're going from city to city to city on flights. You have to find the the happy place and zen in order to not drive yourself absolutely nuts with dopey things that we all get bothered by somebody's behind you on the plane and they decide they want to get in front of you to exit the plane. And now I tend to say, go right ahead. I don't care. You're going to beat me by 11 seconds. You got it. So those little moments that you remind yourself, don't let silly things affect your mood and your demeanor and your comportment. But for my career, I love what I do. I've been really lucky. I know it's not a word that you necessarily believe in, but I believe that there is some luck involved when you show up at an event. You have no bearing on how that event's going to unfold. I've had some great ones in my life. There will be more, whether it's an NCAA championship game that comes down to the wire and ends on a three-pointer to win a team a title, whether it's a Super Bowl last second. I did the one last year on the world feed with Patrick Mahomes throwing a touchdown at the end of the first overtime. They would have gone to a second overtime. Those moments are going to happen. You hope you have the headset on when they do. But either way, I'm going to bring zeal and joy to what I do, which 
probably links to the second part of your question. How do you want to be remembered? I really enjoy doing this. I hope it comes across on the air because it's organic and real and authentic. I like being at the games, describing the action. And that has never faded away from the first net game that I did in 1994 to here we are in 2024, about to be 2025. I have the same level of anticipation for every game that I call. It doesn't matter if it's a national game. It doesn't matter if it's the Nets and the Wizards on a random Wednesday night. I still am excited about how the night is going to unfold. Yeah, well, hopefully my Timberwolves give you a little bit to decide. <laughs> I have them opening night, Andy. Opening oh, no. night, Minnesota we at L.A. In addition, I thought you were going to ask me about the Vikings because oh, I had I them on. I bleed purple. I'd a few purple. weeks ago, they are the real deal. Love Kevin O'Connell. Tremendous story with Sam Darnold. The defense is locked in. It, it's it been fun to watch how people are reacting to this team. And that's the thing in the NFL. You can sneak up on people in the NFL. I know Kansas City is building a dynasty and they deserve all the accolades. Every year, there's a team that emerges that surprises you. And some teams can sustain it. Houston is showing now in year two of this new iteration that they've sustained it. San Francisco is a team that, although they haven't won the big one, you've seen continued excellence. Minnesota is that team for me this year that Now you see all the pieces coming together and great coaching, combining, working in sync with really good personnel. They have a great plan. That stadium, to me, might be number one for my job of doing play-by-play. Your synopses are firing because there's so much happening around you, but good stuff, not the stuff where they're just blaring the PA with music that overwhelms it. I'm talking about the natural sounds of the fans it it, it's an experience for those who have not been to a vikings home game put it on your bucket list it's real it's spectacular and you speak of pa paul allen a guy used to play right back in minnesota an amazing announcer in his own right and uh, hope you're right because uh the the vikings uh every year seem to break my heart Uh, i'm i'm hopeful cautiously optimistic but be optimistic or endorsement makes me feel warm and fuzzy i and i can't thank you enough brother and if you ever make it it this way to visit our mutual friend uh i i can't wait to meet you and and, uh, sit down with you over a couple of cocktails and and learn some more about uh about some other things uh, that uh, that we probably shouldn't talk about here on on (laughs) in the meantime i i wish you nothing but the best and i thank you again for coming on and uh uh thanks again buddy all the best ditto Ditto, Andy. Great to meet you even virtually. One day we're going to do it for real. You know how I feel about Russ Gans. He's the best. Uh, he's He's been my best friend for too many years, more years than I want to uh, mention, because then you could do the math and say, oh, you are older. You're an older person. We. I was at I was know. at one of his birthdays. I won't mention the number, but I I know I know how old you are. But you you look good, man. You look really Thank good. Thank you. The- Appreciate it. Well, it's professional lighting. I had a guy come in. <laughs> Nick, Nick, turn the lights off. We're good. We're done. Yeah, I could yeah, use that guy good. myself. I and you're amazing, brother. Thank you so very. Appreciate much. you, Andy. Little by little, with Andy Schechtman.